Aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman coming to you live and direct from Kailua. Yeah, the background's not Kailua, so but I have the background up there for a special reason. This is one of my favorite places in the world. It's a place on the big island called Pu'uva'va. And the reason I picked this particular photo is because it's got three separate solar arrays. You see one on a building, you see a little tiny one that looks like it's got an X around it in the middle, and you see another big one out in the field. The one on the building is an 85 kilowatt array that runs a small microgrid with about 26 buildings on about 30 acres of property. The little tiny one in the middle is called a power cube, and all those solar panels and the battery and everything that goes with it packs up into an eight by eight by eight Connex container suitable for military shipping wherever they need to go. And then the big one out in the field is a dedicated solar array. I forget how many kilowatts it is. I think it's probably around 120. And it's set up to run a pump, which is on the far left side of your screen there, on my far right shoulder. You can just see the edge of it. It's a water pump that services a community on the hillside way behind in the picture. So this little area, has three separate solar arrays. One runs a microgrid, one runs a well for a community water system, and the other one is totally portable to be deployed anywhere. And the title of the, the, the show today is to grid to, or microgrid, that is the question. And so our guest today is a returning uh, guest that I hope returns a lot more because we have a lot of cool stuff to talk about and going um, from Electrum Power and Technology. And he's, he's done some microgrid programming and stuff for some big electric companies, and he understands the concept. So we're going to have him explain to us where microgrids work and where they're maybe not such a good idea, but how we can make more efficient systems and more resilient systems, more survivable systems, more uh, synergistic systems, if we really thought about how we're designing our electric grids and put microgrids where they belong and put big grids where they belong. So Dan, welcome to the show again today. I appreciate you coming on board and I'm, I'm counting on you to do most of the talking today. So let's kick, <laughs> let's kick it over today and, and let's sure. give us, give us a picture of, um, you know, some of the work that, that you you're familiar with and talk to us a little bit about microgrids and what makes sense. Well, well, Stan, when you and I uh, started talking about this, you said the microgrid to, to grid or microgrid. I said, well, let's just do both. And you're like, oh, that sounds cool. Let's do that. So uh, if we can have them put uh, slide number two up, if we could, please. Okay. There you go. So what that, what that is, now what I'm going to use, I'm going to do, I'm going to approach this from uh, a very practical standpoint, but I'm going to use this uh, as sort of a pattern, of what we're going to do. Here's what we're not going to do, and here's what we are going to do. So what that is, that's the wider refinery up in East Chicago. It's on the south shore of Lake Michigan. Okay. Now that refinery, now uh, originally what they tap into is this, uh, this oil and gas field, basically the state of Michigan. The state of Michigan sits on a salt deposit and oil and gas collects underneath salt. And when rock salt is under pressure, that happens to be one of those materials that's encouraged to hydrogen. So that's a great place for storing hydrogen. Now, that's whenever great. that, whenever that, that gas, that oil and gas field there in Michigan went dry. There's like 36,000 depleted oil and gas wells up in the state of Michigan. Uh, that refinery ended up, unfortunately, had to switch over to importing crude off the Great Lakes from Canada. You go out to the Ni Ni Niagara Falls, and there's a couple blocks out there, St. Louis Causeway, the Atlantic Ocean. So that's Gulf, Mexico, Nigeria, the Middle East, and so forth. And so, but what I wanted to talk about is some of the inefficiencies of that business. What the inefficiencies are, is they're transporting the crude oil to the refinery and that's truck, train, pipe or ship. So they're burning fuel doing that. They either burn crude oil in the refinery or flare gas to fire up a gas turbine there. And then they put that refined product or gasoline or diesel, all that stuff onto truck, train, pipe or ship to get to the customer. So you can look how, how inefficient that entire business is. Now, there are some things on site at that refinery that most people don't realize is that there are usually a number of uh, several different gas wells on that site. Usually they store like ethylene, acetylene, but every refinery always has a hydrogen well. 
because that's where they store hydrogen. They usually make it from steam reforming. They store it underground and they use hydrogen to remove sulfur from the product, from the crude oil, from the diesel and so forth. So understand the petroleum business, they know how to store hydrogen. They've been in the hydrogen business for probably close to 70 years. Right. So that's kind of surprising to everybody in the hydrogen business that there is an expert out there. Okay. Now, the good news for us is that the Department of Energy has documented a lot of this for us. And there's a lot of good resources from the Department of Energy on this whole subject. So, um, and there's actually some equipment at that refinery that's very interesting to me. Uh, uh, things I use in the electrum hydrodynamic compressor for compressing hydrogen. And we'll talk about that later on, but it, it's what it is is the cracker unit. And I'll, describe why later uh, and later on in another talk we talk about compressing hydrogen valves and those kind of things so if we can go slide number three please. okay so a utility guy like me that's a very important map for me so what's on that map you've got uh, it's indiana you got indianapolis up in the upper left hand corner uh that's gary indiana that's up there where the whiting refinery is due north is the state of michigan but what's on that map are high tension power lines, uh, gas pipelines, and more important, it helps me locate depleted gas, uh, uh, depleted uh, uh, natural gas fields. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Because what I'm looking for is the intersection of the power lines and those depleted gas wells. Because I can use uh, those great big huge gas wells to, to, uh, to, to good use, I'll put it that way. So on just on the south, uh, on the southeastern side of Indianapolis, there's a town called Shelbyville. And it's all along the freeway between Indianapolis, Florida, and Cincinnati. Okay, so we can go to slide number four. Okay, so that is the Shelbyville gas field. So that's from the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, right? And all those dots are, are these days, it's, it's gas, uh, natural gas well. So Back when they first started drilling this, it was drilled by Standard Oil back in the 1890s. So they've been drilling for natural gas here for a while. About the 40s and 50s, they ran out of oil and they started doing gas. Now the green ones, those are the wells producing, producing product, right? The red ones, those are the depleted ones. Now, everybody in the, in the petroleum business, take a good look at that map. Sooner or later, that's gonna be all red and that's gonna be the future of that business. Unfortunately, that is the, the truth, okay? Now every state has one of these, okay, has a, has a, a right where you can go and click on the dots and it'll tell you exactly, you know, where that well is, who owns it, who owns rights to it, et cetera. Now, as part of drilling these things, um, uh, kind of important detail is, uh, is when you go out there and drill one of the things, you end up putting, for the state of Indiana, you end up putting up a million dollar bond that's put in escrow by the state, right? And the reason why, in case you go out of business or go bankrupt, the state can hire somebody to go in there when it, when that well runs dry, they can hire somebody to go in there, they pump her full of concrete, they dig down about six feet and they cut, cut the pipe off and they cover it over dirt. So if you're going out there in Indiana, out there in that farmland looking for a depleted well, you're not gonna find it because they've already pumped her full of cement and cut the pipe off and covered her up with dirt. So, so that also means that if we're gonna go out there and use one of these things, one of the things I have to do and I'm going to talk about a little bit about costs and all the things we're going to do. We're going to talk a little cost here. And then as I've got, I know of at least two companies here in the Ohio River Valley that do what's called well services. And so I get a hold of these guys and they'll go out and they'll hire contractors. They'll go out and redrill it. Uh, there's a type of pipe called, it's a 316 stainless steel pipe that happens to be great for hydrogen. But they use it mainly for hydrogen sulfide well. So it's not an alien thing for the oil guys. They use this stuff all the time. You put in 316 pipe. 316 stainless steel pipe and you'll put in your 316 stainless steel wellhead and they can also put on your pipe they can bury it in the ground these guys can you know they, they can put in all kinds of pipeline for you and you can usually do it at, for doing something like this it's going to cost you probably between two and four million dollars per well now hey can i can i from is that 316 the size or the the type of stainless steel type of steel okay Type of steel. Uh, that when we talk about the compressor technology, I'm going to talk to you about the three different types of metallic alloys and the two different types of plastic families that are impervious to hydrogen. And 316 stainless steel is impervious to hydrogen. And I have some really great pictures of the atoms of this stuff, and I can I, I can tell you exactly why it's impervious to hydrogen. 
but that happens to be one of the great, it, it's sort of a fortuitous thing. Uh, and the oil, the oil guys, what they use that 316 stainless steel for is for hydrogen sulfide because hydrogen sulfide is very corrosive. It just so happens that, hey, it, that's great pipe for hydrogen too. So, you know, it, you know, don't lick a gift horse in the mouth, just take it and go with it, right? So now also understand when we're plugging in one of these giant gas turbines, right? There isn't a big giant, you know, I mean, a nine HA gas turbine, 557 megawatts of power combined cycle, gas and, and steam, it does both. Pretty highly efficient gas turbine. If you burn the gas, the gas side heat is not water to produce steam, run that into a steam turbine. So the efficiency will go from 33 all the way to 47%. It's not good as a hydrogen fuel cell, but 47% gas turbine and she'll burn anything. You can't, you can't throw stones in. But anyway, there's no bottle of propane behind the building for that, right? What's feeding that monstrous gas turbine is that is a well, is one of those gas wells. So we can go to uh, uh, page number five, so slide number five. So that's what one of these look like. It is not a small thing. Okay, so usually these wells, the storage in these wells is usually, but right, it averages out about 6.5 million cubic meters of storage, right? So we're talking about storing lots of gas. And when you're talking about hydrogen, well, we're going to go into the volume metrics, right? So everything I'm going to show you, this is practically how, how to do this. I remember I had a, I got in a conversation with somebody and they were wanting to buy uh, one of these grid scale electrolysizers that, that you pack into a 40 foot car container consuming 40, 40 mega, uh, a megawatt of power per hour. When I said, well, you know, that produces 22 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. And I said, well, what's the problem with that? Do you realize how much hydrogen that, that is and how much volume it is? Well, well, I can just put that in a few carbon, for ball, carbon fiber balls, right? No, <laughs> no. In fact, you're not going to be able to buy bottles big enough to hold that much gas, just one hour's worth of gas, right? And then when you find out how cheaply you can produce hydrogen, how, how inexpensive one megawatt of electricity is on the power grid when you're buying power O cell, right? And then you'll recognize that, okay, my problem here isn't producing inexpensive hydrogen. My problem is going to turn into a stored problem real quickly. Okay. So one of the aspects of these wells, you can look at that picture. If we can show slide five again. Okay. We can show slide right there. So on the bottom right hand uh, corner there, there's a picture and I'm holding a lighter in my hand. And what's in there is butane. And that butane is a liquid inside that lighter. Now there's this, an important concept here, and that is it's called a supercritical fluid. That it's different from cryogenics. Cryogenics was what we call a triple point, where you can cool a gas down to the point where it's liquid at room pressure. What most people don't realize, you can compress gases and make them turn into fluids also. Okay. And actually requires less energy than trying to cryogenically cool a gas. So for example, uh, butane, it'll turn into a gas um, at about, about 25 psi. Um, propane is usually, uh, that's about 124 psi. Ammonia will turn into a liquid at 125 psi. Uh, carbon dioxide is 1,055 psi, it turns into a liquid. Yeah, CO2, most people don't realize that. Uh, that's kind of an important solvent for two reasons. One is they use liquid carbon dioxide to take caffeine out of coffee beans, okay? The other place where they use that liquid CO2 is in oil wells. They use it, they use it as a solvent to get oil out of a well, right? That's called advanced oil field recovery, right? Advanced oil field services recovery. Now, the reason why I'm pointing that out is everybody talks about that CO2 sequestration and they're trying to get taxpayers to do this. Ladies and gentlemen, these guys have been doing that for years, okay? So if they're trying, so if some politician's trying to get you to pay for that, point it out and says, oh, you mean advanced oil food services, you're trying to get more oil out of it. Well, and you're gonna use CO2 to do it because that's what that is. Because you can compress carbon dioxide into a liquid and it's a solvent. Uh, and then you got ethane and methane, and usually a little bit under 700 psi, those turn into liquids, and that's what happens at an LNG plant. So usually they spend most of their energy trying to remove the impurities out of the gas, like your hydrogen sulfides or CO2, stuff like that. 
but uh, liquefied natural gas is about 90% methane, the rest of it's ethane, propane, butane, that kind of thing. Now, when you compress these gases into a fluid, they usually get really hot. And what you do is they pump, you pump this through a radiator, blow a fan through it, and it, you know, put it, it through osmosis, all the heat gets rated out. And then when you take this fluid and you release the pressure, it gets really cold. Now, if you say, Dan, that sounds like air conditioning. Ah, you yeah, got the idea. In fact, some of the industrial uh, refrigeration units actually use ammonia and butane to do this exact, or even propane to do this the same exact thing. Now, here's the surprising one. I'll understand this. Maybe he knows this. So hydrogen, at what pressure does hydrogen turn into a supercritical fluid? Like minus 250C or something like that. It's, yeah, it's pretty cold. Yeah. You're, talking really? about liquid, you're talking about liquid, you're talking about cryogenic hydrogen. You're yeah, talking about yeah. freezing hydrogen gas to the point that it runs into a liquid at exactly. pressure. But you can turn hydrogen into a supercritical fluid just by compressing it. See, and there's an important detail. So that pressure, that's about 187 PSI. So it's actually easier to turn hydrogen into a supercritical fluid than it is to make LNG. Now, if you say, why in the heck are we do this? Because there's a compressor problem. That's why. There's been a compressor problem for 200 years. And when you and I talked about the compressor problem and I described what it is, you'll say, oh, that's why we haven't been able to do this 200 years. So when I tell people that hey, it's easier to turn uh, hydrogen into a, a, a into a fluid just by when you it's the idea of supercritical fluid is you compress the gas to the point where it acts like a fluid so it's not a cryogenic fluid it's where I can compress it into a fluid and and so what me, most people don't understand is I can actually you can actually compress uh, hydrogen into a higher density energy form in fact you can compress hydrogen all the way to this point it's called there's something called metallic hydrogen so and we can talk about that later on, what that is and, and how to get there. So is that like metal hydride storage? No, no, no. no. Metallic hydrogen, the planet, uh, the planet Jupiter and planet Saturn have oceans of metallic hydrogen on them. Metallic hydrogen is a superconductor. Metallic hydrogen is a lot like uh, like carbon. It, carbon can is the softest substance and the hardest substance at the same time. Graphite soft in the form of a diamond is the hot, hardest. Well, you can compress hydrogen into a liquid metal called metallic hydrogen, and that's stable at room temperature, room pressure. It's a superconductor. It's why Jupiter has the magnetic field it has, is because it has an ocean of metallic hydrogen, and so does the planet Saturn. So that's the part of this that I've been working on for quite a while, and it might be possible to do it. I have obstacles, but Along the way, the benefit is we get to use some high, highly compressed hydrogen. And I can also compress hydrogen into a form that is much more energy dense than cryogenic hydrogen. So that's wow. important. Well, this sounds like another show. We better get back on the mic. That is another <laughs> show. So, so let's get to, uh, to slide six, right? And if I can get the guy to leave up slide six. So here's, uh, here's the thing we want, want to look at here. So, there in the town of Shelbyville on, so the town of Shelbyville is on the south side of the freeway. On the north side of the freeway, if you get off there, there's an intersection of two high tension power lines, okay? And there's a great big huge field there. So if I bought up basically an acre of land and some mineral lights to one of those depleted wells, we could go ahead and I could put a couple wellheads out there, right? And what I wanna talk, tap into is the substation, okay? Right, and what I'm going to tap into is three phase power off the substation. It's and it's going to be a, a 16 a 16,000 volts is what I'm going to right. And and as long as I'm within a mile of, of that substation, I'll be fine. Well, that's you know that's right across the street from the substation, the other side of the freeway. On the south side, that's that's Shelbyville. There's a, a Walmart there, a bunch of service stations. Perfect place for me to put in some underground pipe to feed a couple of service stations so I can start refueling vehicles with hydrogen gas. So. This industrial park, okay, what's on site is the first thing we're gonna do is on the electrolysizers that I use for this, these are grid scale electrolysizers. These are the kind of devices that you pack into a 40 foot cartridge there. And usually we're tying it in a three phase power, okay? Now, the reason why we centered on this 40 foot cartridge there, understand this electrolysizer is permanently mounted in there, okay? And this, so it's basically this device will consume one megawatt of power per 40 foot cargo container. 
And the two companies that are making these devices right now that I'm most familiar with is ITM Power out of the United Kingdom, out of Europe. And the other one is Millennium Rain Energy. And that's Chris Whitney's company. And that's over here in Dayton, Ohio. And I actually know Chris, Chris's equipment pretty well because I know I went over there and the first um, megawatt grid scale electrolyte, that's electrolyte packed into a 40 foot car container, I actually got to power that thing up. So I feel honored that I was the guy that got to, you know, hit the switch on that thing and power up the first megawatt grid scale. Now, Chris, Chris and I are really good friends. I was on a Zoom call with him this morning, but you, you're right. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. And on top of that, he's close to Indianapolis. Saying, so I can jump in my car and go to Dayton and go talk to Chris. So, but anyway, uh, so, so, so the reason why we do that, now when you build equipment like this, usually you keep track of the number of hours that the equipment's been on. For example, a gas turbine, you do the same thing. What the idea is, is when she gets up to, you know, certain maximum number of hours you're supposed to run this thing, either you'll contract, well, for example, the gas turbine, I contact General Electric or they contact me and I can forecast in the future, hey, come out in such and such state. They'll bring out a new gas turbine in the back end of a semi-truck, right? I'll have a, a, an empty semi-truck, a crane, we'll power down the old piece of equipment, you know, de-energize her, pick her up, put in the back of the truck, pick up the new gas turbine, put her back on the concrete pad, hook up all the power and services and fire her back up. They haul the old gas turbine back to the factory to get it rebuilt. Do the exact same thing with these electrolysizers, right? So what you're paying for, I'm not paying for the equipment, I'm paying for the service, right? Now, generally you wanna work with equipment that has a mean time your freight rate right around 90,000 hours. That's like once in 10 years. Because understand, this isn't mature equipment you're gonna put inside of a building. This is something you're going to put out on the concrete pad because you're providing utility. So that's the reason why I'm pat well, we mount an electrolyzer inside of a, a cargo container. That's why we're doing it that way. Uh, understand this is a fenced in area. It's going to have signs on it. It's going to say danger. It's no different than when you've seen a substation. It's got a chain link fence, barbed wire around it, danger signs. You know, because understand this is the kind of equipment, if you crack a bolt on a valve housing, the pressure is so high, it'll cut you in 50. So just understand this is going to be in the middle, uh, uh, you know, and a sort of a mini industrial plant. So at the center of that is going to be an electrum hydrodynamic compressor. That device is designed the same way. The power supplies and all the machinery that compress the hydrogen, that's the type of machinery I can pick up, put in the back end of a, a semi truck, put in the new equipment, you know, between two to five days, replace equipment, right? You're going to have your gas wellhead there and so forth. Now, the, the one of the aspects about that equipment is uh, well, the electrum hydrodynamic compressor is designed to handle wet gas. So whatever gas is coming, the electrolyzer is going to be wet. Whatever gas coming that comes out of that well, understand that the gas coming to the well is going to be contaminated with water. There might even be some natural gas in there, right? It'd be nice to say um, I had a, uh, a hydrogen fuel cell that could produce 50 megawatts of power, right? But the downside of the hydrogen fuel cell is that it can't burn everything versus a gas turbine, it doesn't care. It'll, yeah, if there's water in that hydrogen, if there's natural gas in that hydrogen, it'll, it doesn't care, it'll just burn it. Now, what that means is down there by the uh, service station, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have a membrane. And the beautiful thing about hydrogen is the smallest molecule in nature. So it's uh, uh, water molecules and natural gas molecules are huge. So it's easy enough to build a membrane that only allows hydrogen to pass in. And if we're uh, if we're if we standardize on a thousand bar in that pipeline through the membrane, higher pressure to lower pressure, put in a pressure regulator, regulate it down to 700 bar, and there's there you got pressure right there for your vehicles, your cars and vehicles, and so forth. Now, in case of what we call a grid islanding event, that's where maybe a tornado comes through, tears out a bunch of uh, uh, high tension power line and basically makes Shelbyville an island, then just simply by energizing that gas turbine and burning some of that gas up that a hydrogen well, we can provide power for the town. So, so one of those electrolyzers will, you're talking about 1 million watts of power per hour per cargo container, right? Well, that's, you know, so a nominal yield is about 22 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. Well, at one bar or, or atmospheric pressure, that's uh, 264, thousand liters of volume. If uh, most electrolyzers put out about 20 bar of pressure, so like 300 PSI, so you're still talking 13,200 liters 
of hydrogen per hour. Again, you're not putting that in a carbon fiber tank. You need a, you, you're going to have to store that in a gas well. It's the only practical way of storing that is gas. Now, what are the costs? Okay, so on, let's see, page number seven. So what is that? Well, uh, that's from Next Era Energy. It's the largest public utility in the country. So I like abusing those guys, and they're great guys over there. Uh, their CEO went to Notre, Notre Dame. So every couple of years, he's out of the conference. So I get to talk. To yeah. Yeah, they tried buying Hawaiian Electric a few years ago, and they did. <laughs> it didn't work. He, pro he probably did. He probably did. I don't think he even knows who I am, but I've shook his hand once or twice. But uh, anyway, they're at, they own Florida Power and Light. They're headquartered out of Miami, but. They're one of the largest public utilities in the United States, and they have everything. They got wind farms, solar farms, natural uh, gas turbines, uh, coal, and, and nuclear power. And they got into, I guess you call it the green energy bit, is a couple of years ago, not not before environmental reasons. They got into it because they saw uh, basically what was happening to coal, that the quality of the coal is what was killing the business, and at the same time. The wind turbines were becoming more efficient. Not only that, but they started actually investing a lot of money in making the wind farms even more efficient. So one of the companies that happens to be responsible for the wind power we have today is Next Era. Uh, the other guy that's actually responsible for wind turbines here in the United States is this guy by the name of T. Boone Pickens, an oil guy. So if you don't know that, I'll tell you this right now. T. Boone Pickens, and he's passed, he passed in 2019, but Boone is the father of wind power in the United States. So when I'm sitting there talking about oil refineries, understand that some of those guys like Boone, it's a wall guy, oil billionaire, right? But he's the father of wind power in the United States. Now, why am I point, pointing this out? Okay, so when, let's go back to slide seven here. So what I'm more interested in here are the costs. So in Neofirm, wind is 20 to 30, Solar is 30 to 40, natural gas, that's gas driven, 30 to $40 a megawatt hour. Coal, 35 to 50, and existing nuclear is 35 to 50. Now, there's a part of this, and I'll tell you this right now, that I can tell you right, right now, that is outdated. So the latest data I've got out of, out of Midwest, Midcontinent ISO is our average price of electricity here in the Midwest is actually $18 a megawatt hour, right? Now I'll show you how, how that turns into really inexpensive hydrogen. So, uh, so we have a spot market, but we have what a futures market. And more specifically, there's something called a PPA. And a PPA is a power purchase agreement. And what that is, so I can go to the next era and I can buy a 15 year PPA. That's where I can fix my cost of electricity for 15, 20, 30 years. Now, next era, they'll take my contract and they use that to justify financing for putting in a wind farm. Okay, that's how that works. So nobody has the cash to build any of this. Everything is financed and you're gonna go through some, a banker one way or the other. And I can tell you all kind of how to finance about everything, including nuclear power, how you justify nuclear power and how you can't justify nuclear power. So that, that might be an interesting com, uh, conversation you and I have later on, Stan, about, about why, why a lot of people won't get nuclear power. and The only people that probably will get nuclear power and how to justify it and can't justify so, but anyway, so and Dan, we're gonna we've got we're done looking down to about thirty seconds left, so oh, we're gonna no. have to have that conversation later. But the bottom line, if I get it right, is that you can take a lot of these areas that have um, basically shut down wells and turn them into microgrids that can produce power locally using wind or solar or some other generation, and store hydrogen at the huge volumes that I. I think most electric companies haven't figured out they need yet. They they don't realize all the energy density and oil that they're going to have to turn into storing in something else, and it won't be batteries. Is that right. safe to say? Yeah, that's safe to say. Now, what I'm just showing you here, I mean, doing those PPAs, uh, the electrical cost of producing hydrogen is like 68 cents a kilogram. I understand there's a lot more cost the equipment and storing it and so forth, but if but what's really driving the cost of hydrogen, the cost of electricity. And right now we can produce hydrogen 68 cents a kilogram. I mean, and those prices are going down because all the new wind and solar we're doing, we're pushing the, uh, you know, we're going to be down to, you know, within probably 2025 electricity, we'll average about $10 a megawatt here, here, you know, here in the lower 48 state part of the United States. Yeah. So right there, that's, that's a huge game changer, changer right there. So let's, 
Can we pick up this discussion next Tuesday and, and continue on? Can do, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Part two. All right. <laughs> so for everybody out there in uh, ThinkTech land, we're going to get back with Dan next week, Tuesday, and continue this discussion and really get into the nitty gritty of why hydrogen makes sense in microgrids and why it makes sense to maybe even do it on the big grid and continue this discussion with Dan Gallon. So thanks again, Dan. I appreciate it. We'll see everybody next week. Aloha. Thank you, Dan.